All right, welcome back. In case you're just joining us, it's time for our conversation right now. Steve Harris, life and business strategist, as well as an author, is joining me right now via Skype. Hello, Steve. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for having me. Glad okay. to be here. Yes, let's get started. Our topic today is understanding the co concept of money and value addition. But I think I will start by asking this question. Um, of course, a lot of us were taught the definition of money, um, perhaps in economics class, you know, when we were all growing up in the secondary school, even though you were a science student like I was, but I did at least economics 101, so we taught the basic <laughs> functions of money and what money is. Uh, is the definition of money more sophisticated now, more than the traditional medium of exchange, a, union, a unit of account, and a store of value? Has money, the definition of money, has it metamorphosed? Um, well, personally, I don't think so. I, th I still think that money is still de defined as the value you get for delivering value. Let me just say that again. So money for me is still the value you get uh, for delivering value. So, I mean, it's pretty much about the same thing. I don't think anything has changed. But I think what's, what's changing um, is how the customers now perceive the value they receive from their, you know, uh, service provider. So that's the most important thing. Mm. Okay. Can you just come mm. again with that so that okay. I can guess can what you said? Again? What do you think that changed? Well, I, I think I think now, particularly because of the disruption that's happened with COVID, um, a lot of our customers are now value sensitive. Um, and also because of the diminishing returns, once it comes to their finances, um, they're a lot more cynical. They're a lot more particular um, who they their money with. The simple solution uh, is every time a customer buys from you, what they're saying is, I would rather have what you're selling than have my money. All right. When they're not buying from you, they're simply saying, I would rather keep my money than have what you're selling. Now, because of all the disruption and, you know, there's so many other people who are offering the same kind of value, I think the most significant thing that every entrepreneur or business owner should look at is to answer the question, what do your customers lose if they don't buy from you? You know, we, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're very clear in talking about the benefits of the customer, but it's no longer, that's a conversation that's no longer so valuable. What the customers now want to know is what do I lose if I don't buy your product or if I don't engage in your services? And I think that's a more critical conversation. Okay, I think we'll come to that uh, in a okay, bit. I think we'll come but the, the other question now, since you're talking about value, the question is, how do I create value? How do you create value? Because from your explanation, the definition of money, the functions of money haven't really changed, but money will chase value. So the question is, for those watching us right now, how do you create value? How do you create value? Well, I mean, the, the very simple non-economic answer is to solve problems. Like somebody once said, the bigger the problems you solve, the bigger the solutions, right? The bigger the solutions, the greater the value that is placed on that solution. The greater the value, the bigger the money attended to it. And the bigger the money they pay you, the bigger the boy or the bigger the girl. So your function of value or the money you receive as an entrepreneur is based on the quality and in many cases, the size of the problems that you solve. Um, and that's never going to go out of fashion. That's still an important uh, indicator for many people who are into business. Um, what are the problems that you're solving? Are they urgent? Are they important? Um, and then what do our customers gain from buying from you? Or more importantly, what do they lose if they don't purchase? Mm. Okay, uh, uh, Steve, you're going to do something for me, for okay. me because I'm getting an echo back. So I guess your, the volume of your TV set is on. Is it on? Because I'm getting... In my office. No, 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 I'm in my office. I'm even using, I'm even using headphones, so oh, there's, no, oh, okay. there's nothing here. Okay, so I don't know where I'm getting that echo from anyway. But, 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 but let's, let's go ahead. Now you've let's told my viewers how to create value. The question now is, from what you said, it depends on the amount of value you're creating. So if you're creating so much value, perhaps you make more money. 
isn't it? It depends on how many problems you're solving, how innovative you are in terms of solving problems. How do you get to that level for those watching us? Because of like, okay, I want to do this. I'm noticing that there's a problem, but how do I get it done? Or how do I even know that I have some kind of intrinsic value to give? I um, well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, many entrepreneurs don't, um, you know, many entrepreneurs start out with passion. You know what I mean? They, they have an idea. They start out with passion. Uh, they jump into the murky waters of entrepreneurship, and slowly they begin to realize that they're drowning. Um, many entrepreneurs generally don't think, and this is not a disrespectful statement, but they usually don't think very strategically about the value they're going to offer. You know, some of the questions that I always ask them when I put them through their paces is to simply ask, you know, number one, what's your product, right? What problem does it solve, okay? Who has the problem, okay? Where are they? How will you find them, okay? How will they find you, right? Who are your competitors? And finally, why should anyone choose to do business with you in the firm. Now, when you put them through those questions, you kind of find that many times they don't have the answers because they haven't thought about it. So yes, you can be passionate about your business, but you've got to recognize that it's not just enough about, um, let me use the word, it's not just enough about looking for the gap in the market. You've got to be able to ask, is there a market in that gap? So, you know, those are some of the considerations that many entrepreneurs need to take into cognizance. <laughs> you know, when you just said right now that is there a market in that gap, right that what came to my mind right now is that we're always being told, or we know a lot of, oh, Nigeria is a big market, or it's the biggest market in Africa, or it's the biggest market in Africa. But sometimes I also tell people what you, also, what you just said, that if you want to look for a market, are you, what, is, what market is in that gap? Is it a market of poor people? Because we are the poorest, as it were, we are the headquarters of poverty. <laughs> it's not a good label. Do you, you understand what I mean? So that market in that gap is a market of poor people. So if you are a business owner, are you also taking a look at that? Am I echoing the same thing? Am I echoing the same thing? Oh, absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with you. You know, we may have 200 million people, but like you said, what's the quality of the people that have the disposable income to be able to make purchases? Um, even, even though they're even, you know, even people who sell pure water are struggling mm -hmm. and pure water is perhaps one of the cheapest, most affordable things that, you know, almost every Nigerian needs. And there, there are lots of people in that line of work, for example, who can't even break even. So you're absolutely right. It's not also about asking, is there a market in the gap? Mm. The question now is a lot of people will say, I have passion. I have talent. How do you monetize your talent? How do you monetize your passion? Because for some people, they'll be like, okay, fine. They, they are even out of work now. But some people may have realized that they have passion or talent in one thing or the other. The question is, how do they create value? And how do they monetize that value? How do they monetize their talent and their passion? Well, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Uh, um, I actually teach a course called Mastering the Business of Your Talents, and I'm teaching that for a couple of years now. Um, and one of the things that I tell people is, you know, mastering the business of your talents is 20% talent, but really it's 80% business. Now, you may be gifted, you may be passionate, you may be phenomenal what you do, but if you don't understand the business behind it, um, if you don't understand the value you're bringing to the table, if you don't understand your competitive leverage, um, you're going to lose. So, again, even though you're gifted at something, the question now is, and let me give this example. So I tell people um, when it comes to, you know, mastering the business of their talents or perhaps maybe thought leaders who want to monetize their message, I say, first off, it's not about your message. It's not about your product. It's primarily about the market right so you've got to be detached um, a lot of entrepreneurs perhaps are very emotionally connected to their products or service they're passionate about it you know they love it they believe it um, but they're not objective enough to look and ask some critical questions simply ask you know, 
is bonus. You know, I, I, I tell entrepreneurs that don't be so focused on your transportation and then lose out on the destination. So if you're an entrepreneur, your goal is to get to the destination. Your goal is to make money. Your goal is to be profitable. Your goal is to reach your customers. Your goal is to make a difference for the products or the service that you're providing. But if the vehicle, right, the vehicle of your transportation, if your, your business proposition is not going to get you to that destination, sweetheart, ditch it. You know what I mean? It's like if you had a contract or you had a meeting that you had to fly to Abuja, thankfully the, the airspace is open, you had to fly to Abuja and you had to hitch a ride to get to the first flight, uh, the, uh, the first, you know what I mean, the last, uh, last flight this, tonight. If you were driving in your vehicle, if you were, t- you were taking your car and it breaks down on, you know, on the road, you're not going to stand by the road and start moaning and complaining and griping and say, oh, my car, my car, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You will ditch the car. Why? Because the destination is way more important than the transportation. So I find that many entrepreneurs are too emotionally invested in their ideas without even putting it through critical thinking and finding out, really, is there a market for this thing or not? Now, since you're talking about entrepreneurship, and what no, came to my mind is, enter- is everyone wired and built to be an entrepreneur? Because if you take a look at what is even happening globally, even in Nigeria, the government will say, oh, we need to create more jobs. Let's, people don't want to work for employers anymore. The mindset right now is be your own boss. Is everybody wired and tailored to be his or her own boss? Yes. I need to ask that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I do think that every individual has what it takes to trade, but not every, not every individual has what it takes to grow a business. I'm going to say that again. Every individual has the, the, the ability to trade, but trading is not necessarily the same thing as entrepreneurship or building a business. And for me, the, the discrepancy is, you know, um, a trader, for example, sees anything as an opportunity to make money. So if it's, I mean, we're in the middle of COVID season, so masks are, you know, all, all over the place, sanitizers, people are making a heck of a lot of money in that. And a lot of entrepreneurs are trading because they're trying to see how they can make that happen. Now, the difference between a trader and entrepreneur is that while the trader is looking for anything that will help them make a quick buck. The entrepreneur recognizes that they're trying to do two things. They're trying to build a long-term brand that will grow their business. So let me give you an example. No matter how profitable masks or sanitizers are, you will never see a bank selling them. Why? Because the bank recognizes that they're trying to build a brand that will not be misconstrued in the minds of their customers. Okay, so many entrepreneurs are, in my opinion, traders or many people are traders. You can find something that will give you an opportunity. Mean that you you have the capacity or capability to build a business because that requires a heck of a lot of different skills. And um, in my estimation, not a lot of people have that. So why is that mindset just still entrenched? You know, why do we still have that? entrenched mindset of everybody should be an entrepreneur and it's you know it's really getting into the mindset of everyone i've been invited to speak in a lot of places and i tell them firstly especially this entrepreneurship thing i tell them on the whole not everybody's wired to be entrepreneurs and you know eyeballs will start rolling oh nancy i say yes not everyone but why is that i am not saying that if you're built to be one you should but not everyone is wired. So you should know your strengths, isn't it? Your skills and all of that. I need you to hammer on that. Yeah, I agree, Nancy. I agree. I think that the reason perhaps that that is more of a compelling narrative now is because, you know, there are not enough jobs. You know? mm. There's not a lot of opportunities. Uh, many small businesses cannot afford to have people on their payroll um, who, so to speak, can help them move their businesses. And unfortunately, again, because like I said, many entrepreneurs don't understand how to how business really operates. They're just playing it by ear. You know what I mean? They're, they have passion, they're playing it by ear. 
So now it's a very compelling narrative where younger people are saying, you know what, heck it, I don't need to work for anyone. I'm going to be the CEO of me, myself, and I incorporate going nowhere fast. It's better to do that in my destiny in my hands um, than to just, you know, hook hook it up with somebody who perhaps may kick me, uh, you know, may fire me, uh, you know, a couple of months down the road. So that's what I think. Hello, YouTubers. Welcome to Moneyline with Nancy TV YouTube channel. This is where we provide you with instructive business directions, processes, and guidance to help you assess the right resources to fund your businesses to withstand every form of internal and external shock. You will find here awesome informative videos on business, entrepreneurship, and lifestyle just to help you make informed business and financial decisions. Punch the subscribe button and let us drive you through the world of business. Please follow all our social media platforms on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and follow us for latest updates on our website. Now, for those that are wired to be entrepreneurs and this entrepreneurship mindset which we have right now, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa, do you think that we are starting well? Starting well in the sense that we do not have many institutions uh, okay nigeria they've started entrepreneurship classes i think in in tertiary institutions but we started quite late as it were so a lot of people do not have the business acumen the financial and business intelligence to get you know on that pedestal it's mostly let's say trial trial and error failure though failure is a lesson failure shouldn't be seen as something that should take you back but a lot of people do not even know where to go what to do perhaps a few books now to read how do we get that on a very good edge so that the entrepreneur or someone watching us right there can understand that concept of money and understand the value addition that he or she needs to create Um, yeah, I, I think that, in my opinion, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are coming around to getting coaching um, and training um, to be able to grow their businesses. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs have done the route, like you mentioned, of trial and error, and they found that it's not exactly working because, you know, they need a strategy. They, they need to, I can't remember who it was, but somebody once said that you can't solve a problem at the level at which it was created. So I see that now a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, are using social media to learn. So, I mean, there are people like me uh, who are also other, you know, business coaches and strategists who maybe every other day we are on Instagram live and we are teaching entrepreneurs from the, the you know, the, the businesses we've been able to transform and the, the, the skills and the knowledge, and the knowledge and the ability to grow their businesses. And I see such a hunger in so many people today who are looking for knowledge, but most importantly, um, they're looking for trusted authorities. So yes, you can read a book um, written by some American or Asian or you know um, British guy, which is great, but you know this is Nigeria. Unfortunately, a lot of the things that perhaps that may work in the US uh, it has no relevance in the Nigerian space. So many times people are now looking for authorities in Nigeria who've grown businesses in Nigeria, who've helped other people's businesses to say, you understand the market, you understand the, the issues of our particular demographic, how do I stand out in such a saturated market? So yes, I do believe that you know, a lot of people are now hungry to grow and are making the right decisions. Now, f growing a business in Nigeria or, or value addition in Nigeria, is it different perhaps from value addition in the US, just like you said? Aren't there universal principles around money, around value addition? Aren't there universal principles? I know like in the US, for example, they have their own different uh, business laws. Here in Nigeria also, we have our own business laws. The new Kama law has just been signed by the president. So I guess that entrepreneurs watching us right now should go read that Kama law and understand <laughs> what it means and how it would impact their business or perhaps a new business they want to create. So that's the dynamics of this country, for example. But do you think that there are universal principles that apply to every climb, then a bit of Nigerianizing what we have? Yeah, I do. I do think that there are very, um, you know, basic universal principles. I mean, such as the like the law of gravity, for example. I mean, whether you're in New York 
or in Bodija, if you jump off a building, you are going to hit the ground. You're going to hit the hard, ground hard. So there are certain business principles that are universal. But again, I do think that, unfortunately, um, we don't have an environment that, you know, drives our people or supports our people to succeed. You know what I mean? Um, you start a business here. Somebody's going to ring you up. I'm not going to call names. Somebody's going to ring you up for radio license and TV license. You want to start a. You want to start a. Uh, what's the word? A delivery agency with you know delivering you know logistics business with your motorcycles. Um, and then the very agencies that are meant to be approving become your competitors. It's crazy. You know, people are taxing you left. It's not even double taxation. I think now it's maybe almost literally triple tax taxation. So it is pretty hard for any entrepreneur to succeed in Nigeria. And you know, I, I, salute, I salute the entrepreneurial spirit of Nigerians. You wake up in the morning, you're hitting the road to get to your destination, and you see people who are already on the road hawking their wares, and just at 5 a.m. they're already selling. So this is an environment that unfortunately doesn't support entrepreneurs, um, despite, to be honest, what I mean, the government will say what they're doing, ease of doing business, all those things are fantastic. But, you know, there's a difference between saying that, oh, it's only 25 percent of Nigerians are unemployed. But if you look, if you go to the street and see and take a sample of every hundred people, you'd be surprised that it's actually maybe over 80 percent. So, yeah, there are numbers that we can we can postulate and put out there. But when the rubber meets the road, when when it comes to the place where it really matters the most, um, I don't think that we're doing the very best we can to allow our businesses thrive the way we should. So, yeah, we got a lot of work to do. In your interaction with entrepreneurs and business owners this period since the lockdown or since um, our first confirmed case uh, of COVID-19 in Nigeria in February till now, with your interactions with business owners and co, give me top three challenges that they have told you about and perhaps give me some of the solutions to those top three that they've told you about on how to handle those challenges. Um, many times their, 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 their challenges vary from, you know, funding, getting capital. Um, number two, probably standing out in a saturated market. Um, and then number three, scaling, you know, scaling their businesses beyond them. So, um, for many of them, you know, getting funding, getting capital, um, you know, from either agencies or, I mean, it's almost out there that the, the, you never want to go take a loan from a bank, even if it's a government bank or an uh, independent financial institution. Um, the hurdles just to get that, you know, are seemingly insurmountable. The collateral that is required in many cases are just, you know, so people are people find that very hard to do. Um, so, of course, usually the immediate suggestion is, look, people don't, investors, people don't invest in ideas, right? They invest in successful prototypes. So usually one of the challenges or one of the suggestions is, you know, can you in some way, shape or form bring out a small size of your big idea? Because again, many entrepreneurs, they want the tree, but they forget that, you know, God has given them the seed, but now it's their responsibility to take that seed, nurture and grow it. And then ultimately they can have that uh, have that tree. So raising capital is a huge issue, um, but you've got to be. Well, usually we talk to them about you know being able to manage goodwill. There are people who they have goodwill with, and if they show a successful prototype, a small size of what their big idea is, there are people who are willing to invest um, as long as they have things like record keeping. They know how you know how how, how much time are you going. If I invest this amount of money, when am I going to get it back? At what you know at what interest? Da 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 da. Um, another thing, again, of course, is standing out um, in a saturated market. You know how it is. This is Nigeria. Once one thing works, um, there's a bandwagon effect, herd mentality effect, where a lot of people now jump into that same river because they also want to get a piece piece of the pie, as the case may be. Um, so for me, it's usually helping them market effectively, helping them communicate the value they deliver. And I think that's perhaps one of the biggest challenges that most entrepreneurs have. Um, they don't know how to communicate the value they deliver in such a simple yet memorable way that your customers can remember. And for me, I always tell them, what problem should your customers have for your name to be the solution? It's as simple as that. What problem should your customers have for your name to be the solution? 
Um, and then finally, it's always about scaling. You know, how do they put systems and structure and process? Because again, many businesses in Nigeria, uh, Nigeria are solopreneurs or solopreneurships, even though they have multiple branches. So you may have a business that has multiple branches, but everything has to go through the CEO because that that person is the final you know decision maker. Um, so being able to help them put systems and structure, even if you do have a one man business is something that a lot of them are also coming around to as well. Mm. How do you now get to that level of what problem do I solve? And when your customer is thinking of that problem that you are the solution, you said it's simple, but I know it's not as simple as that, Steve. That is one of the hardest things and communicating it is key. You know, especially this time, in terms of what value am I creating that when, for example, let me use myself as an example, that when financial or business intelligence is being talked about in the media, not just on TV, Nancy is called. So how do I get, you know, to that place whereby I'm filling in a gap, I'm trying to solve a problem. How do, how do, how do you get there? Okay. Uh, thanks, Nancy. So, so let me, so let me use you as an example. You are, um, a fantastic communicator. You understand money. You understand finances. Um, you know the dollar, the pound, the whole Nisei, Nikkei one 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 hundred or one thousand. <laughs> you get that. Um, now, depending on who you're trying to speak to, if you're if you're trying to speak to an average entrepreneur, they're not interested in all of that. They don't get it, right? And it's not because they don't get it. It's because well, it doesn't meet them at the point of their need, right? So. You have to put it this way. Uh, let me put it like this. I don't think, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they, let me put it this way. I haven't seen hospitals advertise, mm. right? And I'm not saying that they don't, but I'm saying that hospitals usually don't need to advertise because they know who they are speaking to, sick people. If you're sick, you need a doctor, come to the hospital. It's as simple as, it's, it's as, simple as that. Now, when you get there, we can now begin to diagnose, oh, do you need chemotherapy? Do you need rape? Or do you need an aspirin, right? But the proposition is clear. Now, for you who's into financial intelligence and you're helping entrepreneurs, for example, with knowledge about money, the biggest thing the average entrepreneur will pay you for, because again, remember I said at the beginning, it's not about your message, it's about the market, right? So what does the market need? If it's the entrepreneurial market, what are they looking for? They're probably looking for how to access capital. They're probably looking for how to make more money, right? So unfortunately, you know, people who are intellectual and, you know, professional tend to speak from that elevated pedestal of the knowledge, you know, so I'm, I'm here to teach you about the Nikkei 1000 or the FTSE or the, they don't, less of that, your clients don't get that. So you have to dumb it down in the language they understand. And it simply could be simple as I will help you Make, manage, and multiply your money. MMM. -M -M. It's not the wrong that <laughs> MMM. -M -M, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's as simple as that. I will help you yeah. make, manage, and multiply your money. Once your customer hears that, they get it. Once they now come to you, you can now begin to embellish and go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. But many times it's just as simple as, no disrespect, dumbing it down to a way that they will never forget about it. Yes. Thank you, Steve. That's why... Even on the show, I try to do that. That's why you're on. That's why I had to put together what we call Finance Friday. It's a Friday today. You're on Finance Friday to make, at least my viewers, make, manage, and multiply money. So you make, you grow, and you multiply your money. Because I also found out it's not just about the Nikkei 225 and all of that. Government policy is also quite key. Even as an entrepreneur, for you to understand what government is saying about your sector, you may want to start a business in a certain sector. Government may have come up with a law or may have updated that law. That is why you need the gamut of everything. So let's take a look at this. For those saying that there is already a saturated market, I, I like when you were saying a lot of people, something start working now, a lot of people go on a bandwagon effect. How do you survive in a saturated market? You see, I remember those days, many years in Lagos, when the sachet water, what we call pure water, 
came out. You know, it was like a fantastic idea, at least for our own kind of economy. People will be on the, on, on, on the, the traffic and all of that, and they need water quickly. They just buy five naira. I don't know how much it is now, you know. But a lot of people are doing the business now. So how do you really s survive in a saturated market? And how do you still remain competitive in a saturated market while creating value? <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Um, let, me, let me say this, Nancy, um, and maybe your listeners may not necessarily agree with me, but it's okay. Um, the market is only saturated at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. The market is only saturated at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I say that is many, again, many entrepreneurs are playing it by ear. You know what I mean? Like I said, passion, opportunity, and they just jump into it. But they they it's one thing to know how to jump into an opportunity but it's another thing to now grow it and then scale it and then proliferate it so answering your question simply number one you must understand your what you know what i call your customer's dna all right and what's dna very simple your customers customers desires your customers needs and your customers aspirations okay your customer desires your and aspirations so let me give you an example. We talked about pure water, sachet water, right? Um, sometimes being able to innovate in industries to ask why isn't it being done in another way. So for example, you and I, I mean, I bought pure water in traffic, so to speak, right? But I have never, I don't know about you, but I have never in all my years of buying pure water, I have never looked at the NAFDAQ number. I've mm -hmm. never looked at it. I've never looked at where it was being Uh, I'm buying water. You know what I mean? I'm buying water. Now, let's ask the question, why are all pure water sachets, why do they all look alike? They all look alike. They're in the same transparent, trans so, so to speak, transparent bluish type, you know, packaging. Who says, for example, that pure water shouldn't come in a triangle type sachet? There's no law against that, right? But everybody does the same thing. Because now if you're buying water in traffic, you're selling a commodity, right? And a commodity, very I mean, you don't lose anything by not buying a commodity. You know what I mean? So at that level, if I don't buy any, if I don't buy from the vendor, from this particular vendor selling me pure water in, in, uh, in traffic, I don't lose anything. Why? Because I'll find the next guy who's going to buy me the same exact thing. So I lose nothing by buying that water. But as you go a little bit higher, depending on the stratas that you're buying from, Maybe pure water in traffic is five bucks. Pure water in a restaurant maybe is fifty bucks. Pure water at a five-star hotel is five hundred bucks. It really depends on who you're selling to, right? So usually, I, I do believe that yes, there's that crowd mentality and that herd mentality where everyone is rushing into the same industry. But then the question is how you communicate the value. So let me give you an example. So a lady can have very pretty hair, right? Or maybe a, a, you know somebody selling hair on Instagram. And the way most people, I've, I've seen them do it, for example, is, oh, they put, a, you know, they put the hair on the bed or on the surface, and it's, oh, this hair is 12 inches, it's this amount of money. Or they put it on a mannequin and say, oh, they, you know, they, they do some stuff with the mannequin. Or they wear the hair and they're brushing and brushing and brushing and putting pretty videos. Oh, that's great. But if you wanted to be able to stand out in that saturated market, you tell people, I don't sell hair. I don't sell hair. I sell hair that turns heads. I'm going to say that again. I'm not, if you want to buy hair, go and buy it from this person. But if you want hair that turns other people's heads, come and buy from me. Now, what you've done is that you've now sold to their desire. There is no woman, no disrespect, who walks into a room. If she walks into a room with her pretty hair and no one notices her hair, she's going to feel invisible. So you've already, so to speak, thrown shade at any other person who is into the same line of work, and you're telling them, you're already telling the customer that if you wear your hair and nobody notices it, your hair is fake. So if you want to buy hair that commands attention, come and buy it from me. Now that is a totally different marketing class altogether, right? You're still selling the same hair, but how you've now communicated it using your customer's DNA is entirely different. Let me, let me, let me also end by saying this. Right. You can buy. There is no woman, Nancy. Right. Who will buy a Birkin bag. Right. And put it on the floor. No, she will not. She will buy the Birkin bag. 
put it on the table, turn the Birkin bag logo facing whoever is coming so that when she puts it out there, every other woman knows that she is not their mate. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. That I is get a totally you. different conversation. <laughs> I get you. You know what I mean? So it's how you communicate that value. So, yeah. Mm. So communication of the value also matters. <laughs> it matters, isn't it? Because really? isn't it? Because you may even have value, yeah. but how, com how are you communicating it and how are your clients or your customers understanding that communication is also very key. I hope that our viewers are catching, are getting the vibe this morning, are catching the flow you know, of what we're discussing. But, but, but let's, let me take this comment on Twitter. Victor was saying, I remember I went to three banks some years ago asking for a loan to set up a printing press in the town. I lived in then. I saw they had that need and wanted to invest. They all turned my idea down. I had my house as collateral. They all refused. Sad. A lot of people are also in this kind of, um, um, uh, you know, in this kind of position whereby they have a lot of fantastic ideas Either they don't have the money and they go to the banks and the b banks turn their ears down, you know, or turn their ideas down. Even the microfinance banks are not even helping matters as it were. So how do people that find themselves in this kind of position, how do they still navigate through this process? You know, it's, it, it really is sad, you know, that again, like I said, we don't exactly have the environment that supports growth um, SMEs are the engine of any economy. I mean, ask China. Look at all the look at the U.S. Look at China. The, who they are is because of the businesses that they've built. You know, um, Apple was just declared a two trillion dollar company. That is a business. That is a business that has more money than Nigeria's budgets <laughs> and probably earnings put together. That's a business. You know what I mean? And you know, so you can imagine the kind of support that they get. So putting it to, to the Nigerian context, again, like I said, listen, yes, the banks are, they have their, they have their parts of, uh, in, the, in, the pro, in the problem, but they're also there to make money. And that's the truth. And that's why I said at the beginning that and people or banks or investors will only give money to successful prototypes. Ideas are not investments opportunities. You can have an idea from now till next year. They come a dime a dozen. But has your business succeeded to some degree, right? Now, some banks will be myopic. Some microfinance organizations will be myopic. But again, you know, I found that many other businesses now, they're, they're getting into crowdfunding. You know, that is one way to cut off the middleman. You know, people are now investing in your idea to see, oh, this is the small size of our big idea. We're trying to raise this amount of money. Now, that's why, you, for example, you would see many Nigerian tech startups are doing, you know, are going to venture capitalists in the U.S. They're getting, you know, uh, 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 funding, uh, seed funding. Uh, they're pitching at combinators and business accelerators, and they're getting funding. And they're coming back to Nigeria to establish their business, but it's not with the Nigerian money, you know, I mean, or the, you know, the money from any, you know, investor in Nigeria. So, um I do agree with you that there, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, but look, if you have an idea that you believe in it uh, well enough, that you've been able to grow to a certain level, um, you have to show them the numbers. Unfortunately, and this is where the entrepreneurs also need to take responsibility, if you have a business, my friend, and you don't have simple bookkeeping, we're not even talking about audited reports or anything fancy, simple bookkeeping, how much came in, how much has gone out? How much profit do we make? If you can't answer those questions, nobody is going to give you money based on passion, right? And I think just general basic book bookkeeping is even a way to start so that your whoever you're asking for money is going to take you at least seriously. You know what I mean? So that's very important. Mm. Okay, just as we finalize the program, we have less than one minute and let me ask these two questions quickly. What are the qualities that one should have to be able to create value or to, to create and add value in whatsoever thing you're doing, either you're selling goods or selling services? The second one dovetails from what we had said earlier when you talked about, when I asked you about how do you monetize your talent or your passion, and you said it's 20% talent, 80% business. How do you get the business side of your talent? How do you monetize it? Um, so let me answer the second mm -hmm. first question first. So to, to monetize and you know, understand the business of what you do, get a coach, get a business coach. 
there are amazing other people just as amazing as I am who have success in helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses and scale, right? So do your research and look for trusted authorities. You know what I mean? Do your research. Don't don't be caught up in any scam by people who would offer you a quick, you know, quick, quick return. It doesn't happen that fast, right? So you've got to look for trusted authorities. Um, now to your first question, which was, please forgive me, I think I lost track of that first question though. What was it again? Uh, I think we'll continue again because my director adjusted my ears. <laughs> so Steve, <laughs> what would... <laughs> but I think you've answered that second one because I have to hand over to my colleague now. Thank you, Steve, for speaking with me today. Thank you, Steve, for speaking with me today. Thanks for having me, Nancy. Appreciate it. All right. I've been speaking with Steve Harris as a life and business strategist. We've been looking at understanding the concept of money and value addition. For those of us that are entrepreneurs, I hope we've taken one or two things out of it. Okay. If he is in the new studio, Thank you for watching our video. Please hit the subscribe button below, turn on post notification to follow all our updates.